you cannot underestimate the significance of making other people feel significant. And if you do work where you are thinking about how does this make others look, if they feel significant in sharing it, they're going to refer back to you. A lot more opportunities are going to come to you. Things are going to go a lot better when you think in that particular way. So I would say that's the thing that should be kind of at the front of your mind when you're doing this work. Welcome to the Good Life Coach Podcast. I am your host, Michelle Lamoureux. The intention of this show is to awaken you to your fullest potential. Join me each week for inspiring interviews to elevate an area of your life, as well as interviews with women entrepreneurs who are creating success on their own terms. Each episode provides actionable tips to guide you to design a life you love. Hey there, it's Michelle and welcome back to the show. Today, we're going to talk about how to create a referable brand. Joining us is Michael Roderick, who's the CEO of Small Pond Enterprises, which helps thoughtful givers become thought leaders by making their brands referable, their messaging memorable, and their ideas unforgettable. He's also the host of the podcast, Access to Anyone, which shows you how you can get to know anyone you want in business and in life using time-tested relationship building principles. Michael's unique methodology comes from his own experience of going from being a high school English teacher to a Broadway producer in under two years. Such a cool story. We might have to touch upon that. Welcome, Michael. (laughs) Thanks so much for having me. I'm excited to be here. I'm so happy you're here. You are such a great uh, connector. And it's interesting, of course, your work is centered around this. You and Jason Van Orden, who's been on my show a couple of times, hosted a lovely Zoom connecting evening with no agenda really, other than really to create meaningful connections. And I will tell you, it was during uh, the pandemic when it had first started and we were really all home. Uh, This was, you know, a year ago, December, and it was probably one of the most like rewarding experiences I've had where I've got to connect with people in such a meaningful way and in such a fun format. So I want to just thank you for that. I'm so glad. Yeah, I'm so glad you had a, had a good time. I, you know, I think it's one of those things where we were, Jason and I were, were thinking about the fact that a lot of the time podcasting is a very solitary sort of, you know, activity. Yes, you're doing these interviews, but how often are you ever talking or sort of meeting with other podcasters or even having conversations with a, a host of guests as opposed to just one? So we thought, ah, eh, you know what? let's, let's get you all together and get a chance to hang out. And I think it was just kind of the perfect thing at, at that time, because so many people were feeling just like, what do I do right now? Like (laughs) kind of thing. So completely love doing it. (laughs) And it was so much fun. It was really just a fun night. And I was like, Oh, I bet what a cool framework to just connect people together. And it's something anyone listening could also do. Right. I mean, maybe you could tell a little bit more about, you know, uh, how you, thought to pull that together. Yeah. Well, I mean, a lot of the time, what what it comes down to is that I think that people kind of sometimes think that hosting is going to be this, you know, massive undertaking and that only certain people can host. And the fact of the matter is, if you have two groups of people who in essence need to know each other, who it would be helpful for them to know each other, all you really need to do is figure out a time and a place mm. and 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 get it you know and 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 get them together and then ideally you want to have uh, a couple of questions or things that you can uh, ask people to talk about with each other. Uh, and in a virtual environment, you do that through breakout rooms where you say like here's a prompt go to your breakout rooms and sort of hang out. And in a, and an in-person, if you, you know, get to the point where you're able to do a, you know, do an in-person with all of the different sort of rules, you know, around that these days, the same kind of thing where basically there is something for people to do when they arrive, because one of the things that I see more often than anything else is that the arrival point is the most vulnerable for so many people. And and you want to know that there is somebody who has your back in terms of like, well, what do we do next? 
right? I'm not just sort of hanging around trying to figure out like, who do I talk to and what do I do? It's so much easier if you're like, hey, here's this person, go and chat with them, or here's this prompt, go and have this conversation. Uh, And I think that is one of the areas where things can kind of fall apart with gatherings is that opening, if you put too much um, weight on the audience figuring it out, that's when the uh, the event or the gathering might not go as well as you would like. Oh, this is, it's really helpful. I think it's helpful because I think people are starting to gather more. I think, you know, I always think about, oh, I would love to connect this person with this person and often I'll make an email introduction. But if you had the opportunity either over Zoom, the way that you and Jason hosted it when we were all at home or in person, uh, it's a lovely thing to do. Can you, I, I, do, do you mind sharing? I know what the prompts were on the Zoom thing. Maybe sure, give sure. give an example of a Zoom prompt, somebody like as an icebreaker and then yeah. one for in-person, like how would those prompts yeah. be different? Yeah. Um, so, so yeah. So if you were doing a Zoom prompt, it might be something, it might be something as simple as share something with your group that most people don't know about you, like a yeah. quirky kind of, you know, fun fact type of scenario. If you're doing in person, you can actually get even more uh, specific if you know who's coming. Mm. Uh, so one of the things that I uh, would do a lot with my in-person events is I would have people fill out a little something beforehand to kind of tell me a little bit about what they're looking for, what they could use help with. And then everybody who showed up got a card with the name of somebody else who I felt could be helpful in that that. particular situation. So they knew like, who do I go to like right when they got there Uh and then they could start to kind of cluster uh, later on. Cause the, the, the challenge that a lot of people have in, in in in-person social interaction is the uh, dynamic of breaking in, right. Feeling like I need to kind of go up to somebody or feeling like I need to go up to a crowd. So when you do that, when you basically say, okay, you're already matched with someone. Yes. You don't have to worry about that. That's right. And then you have kind of a a goal in mind, like, okay, I gotta go. I gotta go meet Michael. Okay, yeah. where's Michael? Oh, it's nice to meet you. You know, so and so thought we'd connect, and now you've got something to just break the ice with automatically. Exactly. That is so exactly. helpful. I, that's so helpful. Now it's interesting. I wonder with all the kinds of events that you do in the relationship building, how mm-hmm. that ties into becoming a referable brand. You know, yeah. does the brand come first or is it the relationship yeah. building or where's <laughs> tell, talk to us about how that's how that works together? Yeah. So so I think that, you know, a lot of the time what we're presented with is this idea that we should sort of just kind of go out and build the network and go out and start, you know, and 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 have, you know, relationships. But the challenge that happens with that is that when we meet people, they don't really know what to do with us. They're kind of like, okay. I I think we're supposed to be meeting. I think we're supposed to be networking. I'm not really sure kind of what all of this is about. So a lot of the time, if we have something that we're already doing, that we've already created, and the way that I like to think about this is is the idea of the concept comes before the connection. Right. Yes. So you actually take the time to sort of think through, like, what is something that I'm going to develop that I want to sort of put together that then I can share with a network that then I can share when I'm meeting with somebody for the first time. Right. And what this does, especially if it's referable and we'll get into ways that you can make it more referable, but especially if the idea or the concept is referable, that other people want to talk about it when you're not there. Yes you don't have to do nearly as much legwork because people start making intros for you because you created this thing, right? Yes. And and I saw this, I ran a conference for a number of years called ConnectorCon. And the conference was focused on bringing connectors together and basically teaching what is best practice and developing partnerships and building relationships. And as a result of being the founder of that, there were lots of people who made intros, not because of the conversation that we had had necessarily, uh, or you know any of the other things that we had talked about, but because they wanted to show their friend that they knew the founder of ConnectorCon. Interesting. Yeah. Isn't that interesting? Well, yeah. you know, you, you mentioned this idea of having people 
talk about you when you're not in the room. And I think that yes. is the objective, whether you're a small business owner or work within a corporation, you know, whether you know you could be a service provider, a lawyer in finance, whatever, if you need those referrals for your business, then what you're talking about is essential. And I understand that yeah. you have a three-part framework that you like to help people understand in order yeah. to really benefit from how to how to do this. Would you be, could you walk us through through those three? Yeah, great. Yeah. So so basically the the way that you want to think about this is that you want to take AIM when it comes to creating a referable brand. And AIM stands for accessibility, influence, and memory. So the first hurdle that you're always going to be experiencing, especially if you're at a service providing kind of position where you are looking for referrals, you're looking for other people to talk about what it is that you offer, your first hurdle is going to be accessibility. Yes. And one of the biggest challenges that people have with accessibility is they live in what I like to refer to as the echo chamber of the enlightened where they're around everybody from their industry. So they're using all these words from their industry and everybody's kind of patting each other on the back and being like, yep, I totally get it. But you go outside of your circle and people are like, I have no idea what you're talking about. Yes. I used to, I worked for law. I worked as head of marketing for a law firm for many years. And when we'd be networking, like you can't use the acronyms you can't you have to use the language that people understand this is our speak it's not theirs so i totally get that that's (laughs) funny yeah so that's usually the first challenge that that happens right is that we sort of live in this world we kind of know all of this language and it's that classic like a fish doesn't know it's in water kind of thing yeah right so we think We're showcasing our expertise when really what we're doing is we're pushing people away. Yeah, because people don't like to admit that they don't know what you're talking about either. And so instead of saying, and I I actually learned this a long time ago, I'll just be like, I'm sorry, I'm not familiar with that term. Can you tell me what that means? Because I'm very curious and I want to understand the conversation, but I think it's natural for people to just shake their heads. And I I, I was guilty of that for a long time where you just go, cool. I have no exactly. idea what you're talking about. Nice to meet you. I'm going to go move along now to talk to somebody maybe who I understand. Yeah. 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 Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So so the thing that the, the thing that happens with this and the way that you can kind of get around this is what I like to refer to as giving yourself an F. So um, I taught high school for you know a number a number of years. So there's there's usually some education metaphors that you know that fall into the you know fall into this. But basically, you don't want to talk about what you do. You don't want to spend all of your time describing what it is that you do because that isn't interesting to people, and it's confusing for a lot of people because yes. you understand what you do far better than anybody else. Yes. What you want to talk about is what you do for your clients. Yes. So you want to look at this aspect of what is the thing that I'm actually doing for the people that I work with? Yes. And a lot of the time, what we learn about is we learn about the idea of a target market, right? And and we get that classic sort of, you know, I work with, you know, dog owners in Peoria who are, you know, struggling with their accounting. Right. <laughs> right. right. Yes. And, and, and that's sort of this common sort of marketing kind of maxim. Yes. But one of the things that we don't spend nearly enough time on and that will increase your level of accessibility as well as your level of referability is focusing on the idea of a target problem. Okay. So rather than saying, you know, I help you grow your business, which is a very, very sort of general, you know, general idea. Yes. Right. Yeah. I'll say something. I'll say something along the lines of if you are the type of person who has deprioritized packaging your intellectual property and it's been hurting your business, I'll help you package that idea. I'll help you put that concept together. So what I'm doing is I'm speaking to whatever person realizes that they've been deprioritizing that, that realizes that they're doing it. So it's a target problem, right? People either hear it and say, that's me, 
or they say, oh, no, that's not me. Or they say, oh, that's my friend. Right. They're thinking of maybe somebody who does have that problem if it's not them. Exactly. Exactly. And the way that you can get to that target problem, the way that you can start to get much, much closer yes. to what it is that you're actually doing for your clients is another concept I, I, I call SAD. Because if you don't do at least one of these three things, you'll be sad. S A D. And that's solve a problem. Yes. Alleviate pain or decrease friction. Yes. So if you are not solving a problem for somebody, getting rid of a pain that they have, or making it so that there is less friction in the, in the experience, yes. it really falls in the category of a nice to have as opposed to a need to have. Yes. For so sure. You always want to take the time to kind of look at that. And when you do, when you start to ask those hard questions, you know, of yourself, when you start to like, and you talk to your clients too, and you say like, well, what is it that I'm actually doing for you? Which yes. is one of the best questions you can ask when you yes. add that F, yes. right? Yes, yes. Then you can communicate that to somebody else. And from an accessibility standpoint, now they're not bogged down in whatever language you were using before. They can go to somebody else and just listen for the target problem, right? right. Absolutely. So it's so much easier to, yes. go, you know, to, to go through that. So the thing is, once you've gotten past that accessibility hurdle, which is usually the first one, most people spend a lot of time on the accessibility hurdle Yes, and, and end up in these scenarios where they think, think they're communicating properly, but they haven't quite, right? They haven't quite sort of nailed what it is that they're doing. But once you've nailed that, it's not going to move whatever the idea is, whatever it is that you're offering, whatever your business is, it's not going to move unless you have influence. Right. But before we go to the second one, influence, in terms of the accessibility, what's so important about that is that other people then also can, like we talked about, say, hey, you know what, Michelle does that, or, you know, Michelle can help you get your podcast up and running or Michael, you know, is going to help you expand your network or create a, you know, a referable brand. Um, and then they start pointing mm-hmm. people in your direction. And so unless people understand the problem that you are solving, which is a number one sales technique, and most people who are business owners, oftentimes, I shouldn't say most, but oftentimes, or if they're in-house, like as a service provider in some way, don't have that sales background. Yeah. They think more exactly. just sort of like linearly and like logically like, okay, well, this is what I do. Don't you get it? And people yeah. really don't get it. <laughs> and so yes. this is why you have to explain how you're solving that problem or taking the pain off of someone. Oh, wait, yep. you, yeah, you write copy and I don't have to spend the extra two hours, you know, whatever, doing show notes for my show or whatever. Oh, great. Let's talk. That would alleviate some pain for me. Exactly. Right. Exactly. And it starts a dialogue. Okay. So then yep. we get into influence. So, yes. so tell us what that means. Yeah. So, so a lot of us have heard of influence in the context of persuasion. And, and the reason for this is that there's actually a lot of content out there and a number of books yes. that address this idea of influence, right. And say like, okay, use these tools or here are the tools that people use to basically get other people to do things. Yes. Right? Yes. But if we look at true influence, true influence is when you do something without me asking you to do it. Okay. You're going to give us an example. Yes. (laughs) Yes. That's that's when I have influence over you. Yes. So if I share something with you that makes you look better, yes, you will then go and share that with other people. Yes. Right? Sure. Of course. So- if we, if we look at any element of social media, if somebody posts a funny meme and you want to be seen as funny to the rest of your audience and to the rest of your crowd, you are going to post that meme, even though they didn't ask you explicitly to post that meme. Yes. Right? Yes. Or they show a, a TED talk that you're, you know, that you are really inspired by or really excited by. What do you then do? You share that with your audience, right? Yes. You show it off. Yes. And this is a concept I like to refer to as the magic trick. And every thought leader who has really ascended as well as author, 
people who who fall into this category of people to follow, yes. every single one of them has a magic trick. And this is this is how this works. So basically, if you were to go to a party and see a magician perform, every magician has at least one trick that they can take and show you exactly how they did the trick. Yes. They can show you this is how the card disappeared behind my hand or this is how I got the salt shaker to go through the table or whatever it is. Right. And if you learn how to do that trick, the next time that you're at a party, what's the thing that you're probably going to do? Yeah. That trick. Show off the trick. Yes. Right? Yes. So the mistake that we make when it comes to influence is that we're constantly trying to make ourselves look cool. We're constantly trying to be like, this is why you should follow me, or this is why you should listen to me. When what we want to do is we want to create things that make other people look cool when yes. they share it. We want to come up with our own magic tricks. That makes sense. That makes yeah. a lot of sense. Completely. Okay. Yeah. Go ahead, please. So, yes. Yes. Yeah, so, so when we see this, right, like when we see other people's idea or concept, if it's useful for us, if it's like, wow, that would that drawing that Venn diagram really helped me, we're then going to go to our friends and we're also going to draw that Venn diagram for them. That's right. And then people are going to ask, where did you get it? And it's going to refer back to you. Yes. Right. So just like going back to accessibility, yes. if you've got this target problem and you've got people referring back to you because they're very clear on sort of what it is that you have to offer. And then on top of that, you layer on top of that, that you've got some tool that they use all the time, or you've got some graphic that you created. Well, now it doubles that level of referability. Because not only are they, are they able to talk about the problem that you solved, but they're also able to talk about the big idea that you have or the concept that you've developed. Mm. Right? This is good. I see. I do see this, for example, with podcasters or something. I'll be like, tag me on social. And they reshare mm-hmm. the other person saying something nice about the show or their book or, right? You know, I see yep. authors do this all the time. Uh, mm-hmm. So it's it's almost like a testimonial kind of sometimes exactly right when you're like sharing with something nice that somebody else said versus like being like hey yeah yeah and and you're sharing something with your audience in many cases that they then say oh that's useful i want to share that with somebody else okay so let's make that distinction because there's i see two things one is people saying something nice like hey that that show was fire or something right like a particular episode helped them fine maybe you're sharing that But I think what you're talking about is actually what's more important is sharing that useful, like an article. Sometimes with my newsletter, I'll share like, I love this article or things that benefited me. Mm -hmm. Now I'm sharing that with others. Exactly. And when others see that and you're like, this thing benefited me, there's always going to be a percentage of people who read that article or see that thing and go back to the source. Yes, for sure. And yes, like, I do it all that? the time. You know? <laughs> yes. <laughs> right? Yes. And and so so now it's like we're adding additional layers. So yes. so whereas everybody else is out there trying to sort of look for referrals and ask people directly for referrals, which doesn't really work very well. No. Right? Yeah. We're focusing on the idea of making ourselves referable. Yes. And that's a very, very different kind of environment because you're you're really just sort of creating this like element of bringing people to you not only from the understanding of what it is that you can offer but also from the understanding that you have ideas right that's right and and one of the things that i often will talk about is that if you want to become a thought leader you have to take the time to create leading thoughts well that's what i was going to actually ask you should you be yeah. creating that content that is something that people do want to share, you know what I mean? Because it Mm -hmm. is so, it is useful and helpful to others. It's a problem you've solved for yourself and now you're passing it forward. Like a lot of these uh, weight loss experts that you see, like a lot of women who are health coaches Mm -hmm. or whatever, and they share their personal journey as a way to say, Hey, I did it. You can do it. Is that a good example? Yeah. Yeah, It's, it's a good example, but they could go even further. Right. Okay. Because they could say, I went through this, I went through this process, right? Yes. I went through this journey and I learned this thing 
And here it is in three steps. Right. Right. That's what I'm saying. They're sharing that, right. There's their roadmap to the success and it's going to work for some people and maybe not all, which is why there's like hundreds and hundreds of books on weight loss and diet. Um, Exactly. But for the people it resonates with, they're going to be sharing it. Exactly. And it works, you know, it works for, it works for them. And one of the things that you're bringing up, I think that's also a very important point of distinction is we have to pay attention to the difference between frameworks and formulas. Okay. So a formula is when somebody breaks down, this is exactly what to do. This is exactly what to say. And your job as the consumer is to basically just kind of plug into the formula. It doesn't require thought, right? It's very paint by number. Yes. And only a handful of people have success with a formula because their, their background, everything about them is there are all these different variables, yeah. right? That don't yeah. apply. We're unique. We all have unique experiences. It's not all going to fit exactly. into this perfect little yeah, formula. Exactly. Whereas when we provide somebody with a framework for a way of thinking about things, yes. we're actually not saying do it this way. We're saying here is a different way to think about it. Yes. And then they can plug in their own points and ideas and concepts. Yes. Yes. So it's significantly more effective. Agreed. 100% agree. Yeah. Okay. So if we have the, we get the accessibility down, we understand this because you're giving us, this as a framework. Now we have to yep. make it our own, right? And fill yep. in, this isn't, here's what exactly what you're going to say, like the prompts you gave us that we could use yeah. exactly. This is yeah. now just the framework. Um, what's, exactly. what's, what's the third third part of it? Yes. So the third part is memory. Okay. And you could have the best material in the world. You could have the other two things in, you know, in spades, but if people can't remember the concept, the idea, whatever it is that you shared, yeah, they will share somebody else's thing that's easier to remember, so even true. if it's not as at the level of quality of yours. Yes, right. If again, to your first point, if you're overcomplicating it and over you're using all these acronyms and people don't understand, mm-hmm. then somebody's saying the exact same thing as you are. In much simpler language, we see with politicians too. I mean, I'm not going to get into politics, but yeah, right. Where it's like just, you know, for the masses and people can really take it in, Mm -hmm. then that's what that's often what's shared. Yeah. And they can hold it in their memory. So the way that I like to think about, you know, memory is if you want people to remember more, you focus on less. Okay. Can you give us an example? Oh, go ahead. Yes. Language. Yes. (laughs) Language. Emotion, yes, simplicity, and structure. Okay. So I'll start with language. Okay. So the reason why most of us know who Shakespeare is, and only a handful of people and English majors know who Christopher Marlowe is, even though they were writing at the same time, is that Shakespeare actually added new words to the English language. So if we go into the dictionary, there are words that are there that Shakespeare coined, that Shakespeare actually created. Mm. So if people were going around using those words, what happened? Going back to what we were talking about before, people were like, well, where did you learn those words? And then, oh, at this play, and it just, it always pointed back to Shakespeare. Yes. Right? Yes. So the thing is... Creating your own language or deciding to say something in a specific in, in a specific way is is work, and you will have to test your language. Like you will have to figure out like what language works and what language doesn't, and it's a it's a process. So a very large percentage of people don't ever just do it, right? Like don't ever spend the time to look at their language. They just pull somebody else's language or they parrot something else that they've heard. Yeah. Right? For sure. If you come up with your own language, you come up with your own way of saying things, you come up with your own way of doing things, what ends up happening is now people are kind of gathered around you and your language, and you've carved a piece of mental real estate in terms of people's minds, right? Yes. So so now they're kind of thinking, oh, that, where did I hear that word? Oh, I heard that word in this group, or I heard this, that word from this person. Yes. So if we take the time to come up with our own language, 
we give our community something to kind of gather gather around. And, and this is why there are people who speak Klingon, right? For real, they do, right? <laughs> there, yeah. there are. There are people <laughs> okay. who have like taken the time to learn this. Wow. You know, From imaginary Star Trek? language. Star yes. Trek? Okay. Right. And and why? Because that brings them all closer together. Right. If you're yes. in a if you're at a Star Trek convention and you speak Klingon and it is flawless Klingon, you were seen in a completely different light in that environment, in that community, than pretty much anywhere else. It's interesting. Well, and part of what you're talking about with language then too is the fact that we are all kind of hardwired to want to be part of community. And so anything that brings us a sense of connection with others is something that we're naturally going to gravitate towards. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Which is why this makes sense. Yes. Yeah. Um, and then the other thing that ties to you, if you are in the coaching space or in the service providing space, if you come up with your own definitions or names for things that people struggle with, now you become the person who diagnosed the issue. So if you're able to come up with a concept or an idea and you give it an actual name, you call it something and nobody else has called it that. Well, now anybody who is like, well, I'm not really sure what to like, how to describe this thing. You've just given them a way to describe it. Mm -hmm. So what do they do? They then go around and start describing it to others. Yes. And that becomes another thing that refers back to you. Yeah. It's funny because one of the people that I met in your networking event that you, over mm -hmm. Zoom was uh, Patrick McGinnis, who coined the term, the phrase, fear of missing out, FOMO. Yes. FOMO, right? yeah. And yep. how many years later now? I mean, he came on the show and talked about it. It was a really fun conversation, um, mm -hmm. but it's still being used. And then somebody yep. even wrote a book, Jomo, or whatever, the joy of missing. I mean, you know, it's like yeah. it just keeps getting used, but it is again, would that be a, a good example of totally? Take, yeah. Okay. Totally. He, yeah. He found something that basically people were experiencing and he yes. gave them a very easy way to describe it. Yeah, for sure. Right? Yes. Um, <laughs> to just like, boom, it's like right there. Um, and FOMO, right? Like just think about just the, the way that sounds from a language, you know, from a language standpoint, people yes. are like, well, what is that? And right. then fear of missing out. Oh, okay. Now I get it. Yes. You know, that it, was my just, experience when I first heard it. Right. What, what is exactly. that? What's FOMO? Yeah. Oh, you haven't heard? It's fear of missing out. I'm like, oh no, I haven't heard that, but okay. I got exactly. You. And then you hear yeah. it everywhere. Yeah. Yeah. So that that's why language has such power in our memory. Right. Mm -hmm. And, and think about it, like Patrick just got mentioned on this podcast. Exactly. Right? No, good point. <laughs> no, totally. And actually, you know, I, once you become familiar with the term, then you do notice it in other places. Ellen, De, Ellen DeGeneres was using it. And, yeah. you know, it was like, it would show up everywhere. I'm like, oh gosh, people really do use this everywhere. Yep. And, exactly. and yes, you just made the point. Patrick was just mentioned on the podcast for sure. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So, so once we've, once we've really sort of handled language and we've thought about, we've thought about our language, the next thing that we want to think about in terms of memory is emotion okay. and emotion solidifies memory. And that has to do with primitive times, because if we were attacked in primitive times, our, our primitive brain had to remember all of the details of where we were attacked. Cause that was what would protect us. Yes. Right. So our brains become like a sponge in heightened states of emotion, whether that be moments of sadness, whether that be moments of like peals of laughter, whatever it is, if we are in a heightened state of emotion, we are far more likely to remember a lot of the details, right? Yes. So when we do things that cause that emotion, we write in a certain way, or we do a, an impassioned video, or we tell a really intense story, basically everybody's brain then is ready to receive whatever mm. comes next. And mm. this is one of the reasons why you see a lot of TED Talks and presentations that will open with this sort of connection story, 
yes. right? Where they're yes. basically talking about something that's really personal and true to them and honest to them because that audience is sitting there and like they're, they're feeling all of those emotions. So when that person, after they've finished that story, starts to share the big idea, yes, your brain is like way more likely to absorb it yeah, and sort of so bring, it, bring it in. So true. Yes. And we don't do this enough, right? Like we don't do this enough. We don't take the time often enough to say, what words could I be using? What ways could I be describing something that would tap into emotion that would cause somebody to feel something when they're hearing this? Yes. But if we do, it basically becomes another memory marker right? Where it's like, we remember that feeling that we had when that person was saying that thing. So now any other time we have that feeling, that idea or that concept starts to flood up again for us. Mm. Yeah. And I've spoken about this before, where if you were to ask any number of people what the opening scenes of the movie Titanic are and give any kind of detail, very, very few people could give you an answer, but you could ask that exact same room of people, what image comes into your head when I say, I'll never let go. Mm -hmm. And most people will have an image in their head because it's at the height. It's at the, one of the most heightened sort of moments of the film. Yeah, completely. It's funny. I knew you were going to pick that movie when you were because yeah, it's an iconic movie, right? And that right? The, the vis yeah, the, the visual is so in our brain and and the emotional piece of it. Okay. Exactly. Exactly. Okay. Um, so the next one is simplicity. And this goes back to a lot of what we were talking about at the very beginning. Academics have always rewarded complexity. Yes. So we have always been rewarded for using the big words, writing the big papers, sounding smart, right? Yes, yes. Has always been sort of the, the thing that we've aspired to. But the memory rewards simplicity because our memory can only hold so much information Yes. at any one period of time. Yes. So if you ask me to pick up four things from the grocery store, got a pretty good chance of remembering those four things. I don't need to write it down. Right. If you ask me to pick up 32 things from the grocery store, you're not getting your groceries, right? right. <laughs> like right. it's just because the brain can only hold so much information. Yes. So when we're thinking about, well, what do we want people to share? What do we want them to refer? What do we want them to use? We really, really have to spend the time to ask, okay, if they're going to remember this, how am I going to make it really simple? Yes. Really, really simple. One sentence. Yes. You know, yes. one line, yes. one idea, not 20, right? And, and I think that the challenge that a lot of people in service positions, in co like coaching, consulting, they, they want to give value. So they're like, I'm going to just like, I'm going to share all the things that I know and all the things that I understand. Yeah. And, and sometimes the mistake is when we believe that we're over delivering, we're yeah. actually overwhelming. Well, that's actually really important. I think for people to take in, and I think it, you know, yeah. a lot of people in a service business coach, mm -hmm. whatever, you know, consultant of some sort wants to be helpful. Yep. And so you're right. We can overwhelm versus yeah. help. Yeah. Yeah. Not and, and the brain can only handle so much. So the brain is going to, is, is trying to process all of that information. Yeah. So if there's too much of it, yeah, it's like, oh, man, I don't know what to do with this. You know, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm kind of lost. Uh, and that actually ties to the very last piece, which yes. is structure. Okay. Because our brains need order in order to process information. Okay. So if something is structured in some way, if we know like this comes first, this comes second, this comes third, it's a lot easier for us to process yes. than if something's sort of like all over the map. That is, it's so true. But how do we, can you just give an example of how to actually implement that? Sure. Um, 
what I, this concept of less is a perfect example of ordering the information. Okay. Language, emotion, simplicity, and structure spells less. I was just it noticing that. You, and I was, yeah. I was going to tell you, you've got your accessibility, influence, and memories is aim, aim less. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yes. You've got two, but I know. So, okay. So less, so less is more. That's yes. your structure and way to remember. Exactly. Yeah. So that helps you sort of see it and say like, okay, that's the structure. That's the way to remember the, you know, that's the way to remember the, those right. concepts. I'm going to do language, but, emotion, simplicity. Exactly. But, um, you know, a, another classic one is, um, Simon Sinek's golden circle, right? It is a bullseye in essence, which is just the what, how, and why. Yeah. So it is a structure for your brain. You're able to be yes, like, okay, this yes. is how, you know, this is how it works. Adam Grant's givers, takers, and matchers. That's a structure for you yes. where you're able to be like, oh, okay, there's these three types and this is how they kind of play, you know, within, you know, within each other. Right. Yes. And to your point, both of those people are, are hugely referable well, we won't call them brands, but they're the right. I mean, yep. Everybody knows yeah. your, you know, what's your why with Simon and Adam Grant's work. Everybody's Ex- always, it, and if you're on any social, you're seeing somebody repost something that Adam Grant wrote. Every yeah, day. and yeah. and it and if you look at the the con like Adam Grant is a magician. Right. Like he and and he basically has dozens of magic tricks. Like anytime you see a concept that he presents, it's something that you could very easily take and draw for somebody else or show to somebody else. And it would make you look better. Right. Yes. Yes. That's the right. That's the essence of his, his success. It sounds like, I mean, this is how because it's just so easy to share and that makes other people feel good again, wanting to be helpful. And then it also makes them look, you know, smart too, right? Now they're exactly. sharing this and then it all goes back to Adam. And so yep. people start going back to his work. Oh, let me pick up that book or check out, you know, his website and learn more. Exactly. Exactly. And, and this is the thing we spend so much time on the outreach on the like let's you know let's connect let's like get to know people let's share our you know let's share our message let's promote like all these things when we should be spending significantly more time on what it is it it is that we're saying and is it something that is referable is it something that people are going to see as useful that they're going to want to that they're going to want to share mm. that they're going to want to put in front in front of others and i think that all too often this is what happens is we are presented with this this idea that the the relationship building component is going to do all of the heavy lifting for us that if we just like get to know people if we just network if we just sort of build as many relationships as possible then we'll be able to sell the service right but that's not the case yeah it doesn't work that way we have to have something that's interesting we have to have something that we've created we have to have something that's ours in order for people to want to make those intros in order for them to feel confident in making those intros. Cause we all know the people that will refer no problem because we're like, I know exactly what they do. I know exactly how they can help people. I'm That's very, right. very clear on the target problem, you know, that they have, and we have no problem making those referrals, but somebody who is kind of all over the map and hasn't really gotten that language down we're we're kind of like, well, I don't want to, introduce them to my friend and, you know, for their service. Cause I really don't know yeah. what they're going to provide yeah. from a coaching standpoint. I don't know what the value, you know, a- actually is. It's so true. Um, this has been fantastic. Cause I think anyone who is in a service business is a small business owner, is an author, somebody trying to get their messaging out is, now has your framework and they can listen to this and take notes and then go through the aim. I'm going to get, make mm-hmm. it an acronym, the accessibility influence and memory, and then the less and mm-hmm. think about ways that, you know, in context of how they've been showing up and how they can change that. 
and yeah. how they can change that. You have, I believe, a freebie on your website. Where can we, Michael, yes. where, where do we direct people to want to learn more yeah. about the work that you're doing? Yeah. So if they go to, um, if you go to myreferabilityrater.com, that's actually a tool that you can use to see how referable you are. So if you go there, you can actually fill in a series of questions and it will give you a score based on each of these categories. Is this your site? Yes. Okay. So it's my referability rater. Yep. Dot com. Dot com. Okay. Yep. So do you not have a Michael Roderick website too, or is that your I do have um I, I have smallponenterprises.com yes. is the is the regular is the regular website. Yeah. Okay. So we can I'll I'll link both of those. Um awesome. anything you wanna um end with today before we sign off or and the 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 thing that I always like to end with is you cannot underestimate the significance of making other people feel significant. And if you do work where you are thinking about how does this make others look, if they feel significant in sharing it, they're going to refer back to you. A lot more opportunities are going to come, come to you. Things are going to go a lot better when you think in that, in that particular way. So I would say that's, that's, that's the thing that should be kind of at the front of your mind when you're doing this work. This has been so interesting. I so appreciate your time, Michael, today. Thank you so much for coming on. And um, I look forward to reconnecting with you at one of your networking events again soon. Awesome. Thank you again so much for having me. I really appreciate it. Thanks so much for tuning in today. I hope you gained some new information or inspiration for your life. That is that the essence of this show is to really wake up to what's possible for you to reclaim your beautiful voice and to really learn to love and prioritize yourself. So if you gained any value from any of the conversations you've tuned into, make sure to subscribe on your favorite podcast player. You can do that right now on your phone. And please do consider leaving a rating and review if you have yet to do so on Apple Podcasts. It's actually how more women can find the show. And I really want to grow a community of women who are loving themselves and living full on. So thank you as always for tuning in. And I look forward to reconnecting with you next Wednesday. Bye for now.